Amen. God is good? All the time? God is good. Hey, I'm glad you're here tonight. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I am loved by a good, good father. That's who I am. Let your other neighbor say, that's who I am. That's who I am. We're so affected by the people that we're around that are not perfect, and we forget that the one that is perfect loves us. That's good news. If you have your Bibles tonight, turn to Romans. This makes me want to get down there, like get down amongst the people, but then there's some of you back there, stragglers, rule breakers. <laughs> Pray for you. Romans chapter 3. We continue going through this letter of the Romans. It's a real simple message, real short. Some y'all, That's hard for some of y'all to believe. Say, so, yeah, we've heard that before. But really, I think this one is, it's pretty much just, it, it says what it says. The problem is, if I went past this, then it would not be a short message at all. And so, kind of had to either stop there or, or go past, which would be, anyway, you don't need to know all that. Romans 3, chapter 3, verse, begin reading in verse 9, quite a bit of reading. It says this, it says, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin, as it is written. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is no one who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, with whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may be accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Verse 21. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Pray with me. Father, we just love you, Lord. I just, Father, we come to you. Father, we're, we're, we're not worthy. God, we're sinners. We're flawed. We're messed up. We've done it all wrong. But, Lord, by your infinite grace and mercy, you reach to us. And so, Lord, I just ask that your Holy Spirit would be here tonight, that you would speak to us, your people, a simple word, Father, but we would understand that in you, we have hope, and in you, we're all together. Have your way in this service, in Jesus' name, amen. Bless you. I was going to mention this before I got started, but just because there's few of us, and sometimes that's the reason, but it just kind of feels like everybody's kind of down, everybody's give out, and it's warm out, and I know a lot of people are gone, spring break and whatnot, but just a few uh, reports, I know that that uh, sometimes we feel like nothing good's going on. I know I do because I hear a lot of negative. But there's just been a lot of stuff. I know that, I think we've said this in here, but Renda had, she's had a procedure done a few weeks ago. Her reports have came back. It's negative. Uh, we had another report. Skeet's daughter, oldest daughter, uh, Wendy, Wendy, she had to have surgery, and she, she I'm not going to try to explain it, but she had a lot of stuff in one area. The doctors told her, don't, hurt, don't hope for a very good report. And they got her report back this week, and it was all isolated, and they got it out. And so they were praising God. Many of you know Jack and Linda have been through the ringer. Uh, Jack's been, it's been amazing. But anyway, they got out. They're at home tonight and uh, with a machine to help him sleep at, good at night. I know Donna's daughter, Brittany, has been going through a lot of struggles and with the kids and, and been in court and all that stuff, they've been really concerned. And 
uh, they got a really good report on that. And so that's still got to be worked out like all of us do. But I'm just saying a lot of good stuff is happening around us. And sometimes we get so focused on the negative. And so anyway, I was going to share that before I started. But the cool thing is God is no respecter of persons. If he helped one, he'll help us all. He does it. That's what he does. That's it. That's his business. If we're his children, <laughs> he loves and cares about you just as much as he does the most righteous one you know. So we ended up last time we talked about, and it's been a couple of weeks, I guess, but the last time we were talking about in Romans, and, and we kind of went through a spell where uh, he was talking about watching out for those that those sometimes who justify their, their lifestyle. They justify evil or wrong living because they, they know just a little bit of truth. They know enough truth and they fo- focus on the truth that they know. And boy, they're really good at that part of it. But then the, the, this other stuff that they do is not so good. And, and, and we talked about how sometimes in our minds we, we're good at justifying sin. We're good at justifying lifestyles that are not pleasing to God. And, and so uh, we, just, we, have to, we have to watch out. When we're doing that stuff. And that's what he was talking about. He's, he's saying those people that, that go about their business that way. He goes and he tells them that it gets them in a lot of trouble. It, they, because the thought is that, that, that we talked about. And I'm just confusing myself. But what I was even going to say. But the thought is that people are saying. Well if we're called to glorify God. And you're saying. We talked about how. You're saying that if my sin and my wrongdoing brings about the law and shows that God is good and his law is good then if what I'm doing is bad and he works it all out for his good anyway then why am I being judged for doing evil why are you penalizing me if I'm glorifying God in my sin and he, he said that is a dangerous place to get through when we start playing the devil's advocate and we start looking at it that way he went on to, in the end of verse 8 when he says this he says their condemnation is just and it is deserved When people start going about that, that's what Paul says. Their condemnation is just and it's deserved. But tonight for a minute, I want us to look at us. Because so many times this is what we do. As people, and I think even as the church, we take a a passage of scripture like that when Paul says, man, their evil doings, their condemnation is deserved. And so what we start doing is looking outside the church. We start looking at everybody else and we start pointing out, what is wrong with them? Anybody know what I'm talking about? We start pointing out what, what, is, what, what everybody else is doing wrong. And I want us to, sometimes I think we need to look at us. Because I don't know very much, and I'm, I can, and I'll say a little bit in a minute about that. I can judge people just like everybody else. But I know this, what the Lord has done in me and how the Lord has changed me, it didn't happen by looking out there. It didn't happen by looking at other people, whether it be good or bad. It happened by looking in here because it was always for me about looking inside. It starts on the inside of a man. And as it gets well, it can come out and then it can turn into something. But if we're looking outside and we don't deal with in here, then we get twisted. And so I just want us to look at ourselves a little bit tonight. The first thing we understand is that Paul has been working. He's really been working over the Jews trying to to get their thinking shifted. Because remember, the Jews always thought that they were superior to the Gentiles. The Jews were always, we're better. We've got the law. We know the stuff. We know what we're doing. We've been doing this stuff. We're better than y'all are. But here's the point. If we're not careful, you and I do the same thing. If the church is not careful, this is what the church begins to do. We start judging everyone else. We start uh, calling everybody else out, and we don't look at ourselves. We turn into the the very people that Paul was talking about. Let's just say this. We slipped away for a couple days. Neely's out of college, and so very seldom are we all together anymore. And so we slipped away the other night, and, and we headed off down to a little place around Marble Falls, and it was a cool spot. And, and, and we were down there, but, but, but here's the thing. We slipped away, and we, we were around a lot of people and a lot of stuff going on that it appeared that they were lost. You know what I mean? I mean, it, it appeared like Jesus wasn't anywhere around, okay? I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying this. And so it was, it was hard for me at different points in this two days, 
it was hard for me not to, not to have a notion of judgment on some of these people. As I'm sitting around and I've got my kids and we're trying to do stuff as a family and all this, some other stuff's going on around us. And it was hard for me not, not to judge people because number one is because I'm real tight with money and I cannot stand to spend money. And this was not, it wasn't cheap, you know, this was a nice place, you know, and they're supposed to serve you and they're supposed to accommodate you. And so when you're paying for something and the service is poor, you know, you're like, come on, man, what are you doing? I mean, you're not getting minimum wage right here. People not doing their job. I mean, it burns me up. I know many of you can relate and whatever, but you're around people all the time, and they're called to do a job, and they don't do their job. And so that was going on, and then I'm around these people that are on the pay grade. They're in another scale than I am, okay? So I understand that. But still, when people are haughty and people are disrespectful, it's like, oh, where did y'all come from? Y'all know, I just rolled in from the country. I can tell y'all's a little bit rural. What are you doing down here? <laughs> and so I'm dealing with all this stuff, and, and so we're, we're around stuff. And then I, I'm, I'm seeing these families, you know, which is, is great, but I'm seeing these families, and the, kid, the parents are supposed to be watching their kids, but instead the parents are getting drunk. And they don't realize it, but instead of them watching the kids, the kids are watching them and how they behave and what they think is acceptable. So I got this stuff going on in my head, and then we're around this place, and can I just be real honest with you? There is a lack of clothing. It doesn't matter if they're 10 years old when the first start of you know, start, things start shaping or they're 65-plus years old and they're walking around wearing all kinds of stuff. And now listen to me. If you're going to go swimming, you can wear whatever you want, but get in the water and go swimming. Don't march around there serving hot dogs asking everybody flums I mean just don't it's just not good and that's funny and it is funny but in the midst of this in the midst of me seeing it in the midst of me having these thoughts go through my head was the word of God and this question it was on the forefront of my mind because I knew where we were at in Romans. And the question is in verse 9, are we any better? Are we any better than these people that we so easily dog, we so easily degrade, we so easily judge because they don't see things the way I see them? Because they're not where I am, maybe. Especially when I know the answer to the question. And the answer is no, as Paul says in verse 9. No, you're not any better at all. No, I'm hammering the Jews, and I'm speaking the truth, and I'm laying it down to show you the way that's going to lead you to life everlasting. But at the end of the day, you're not at all, we're not at all any better than anyone else because God loves all of us, and nothing can separate us from the love of God, not anything we do, not anything we're ever going to do. Now, that doesn't mean we're walking with Him. That doesn't mean we're saved. That doesn't mean we're right. But I'm just saying this. At the core of it, none of us are better than anybody else. He's been making this whole case about the Jews and the Gentiles and eventually the whole world, as it says in the end of that verse, that, that the whole world, are, we're all under sin. We're all under sin. There's this sin that's over us. And so in verses 10 through 18, really all he's doing is this is requoting Old Testament. He's re-quoting re passages, and in, in many of them for, are from David in the Psalms. But in verse 10 through 12, he says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not even one. There's none righteous, no, not even one. There is none who understands. Man, sometimes we start thinking we know some stuff. Amen? And you know what? We know more than we used to be. But the reality is this. Man in his infinite wisdom, at all of our knowledge, and as smart as we get, we're only at the beginning of the wisdom of God. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has entered in the hearts of man. He's saying all you can store in and all you can begin to fathom, you still are only at the beginning of really understanding what God does, what God knows. There is none who seeks for God. Verse 12, all have turned aside. Together we have all become useless. There is none who does good. No, there is not even one. That's quoted from Psalms 14, Psalms 53. And I love this in Ecclesiastes 7.20. It says this. I don't love it, but it is. It says, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good. 
who never sins. That means this, we all have moments when we're doing some good. But we also all have moments when we're not perfect. We all have moments when we're praising God in here. And then we go down the street or we go over yonder and something happens. And I start doing the very thing that we just talked about in church. And I start judging somebody else and I start looking down my nose at someone else. None of us are perfect. And here's a check for you. If you're sitting here thinking, I got it going on right now. I am tearing it up. You ain't talking to me. Then you have just revealed that you have the sin of pride in your life. You see, we're all at flaw. God is the only one that's good. He's the good, good father. Verse 13, man, it's just going down through here. But it quotes from Psalms 5, 5, 9. Again, there's nothing reliable in what they say. Their inward part is destruction itself. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Do you know anybody like that? <laughs> Some of us have been that. Verse 14, it's from Psalms 10, verse 7. It says their mouths are full of cursing, bitterness, and deceit. That's why we have to watch what comes out of our mouth. It's a spring. Life or death comes out of it. Verse 15 through 17, it says their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their hearts. They're always wanting what they want. They're always wanting their own thing. And the paths of peace, they haven't known. People don't want peace. They want to be in charge. They want to be the boss. They're not looking for peace. God's people ought to be different. Verse 18 says their transgression or their actions, it show their heart. They don't fear God. They're doing stuff to be seen. Hide and watch what they do. They can tell you whatever they want, but it's going to be revealed by how they act. It's going to be revealed by how they respond to things. Verse 19, it goes on. This is a lot of wordy stuff, but basically it says this. We know that the law is truth, and it speaks to shut up those who are self-righteous. Those that know the law, the law is given so that it would reveal that none of us are okay. The more religious we get, the more knowledge we have, especially in the Old Testament of the law, the more that we know of God and His Word, the more we ought to realize how flawed we are. You see, I've been been trying to be all in with God for a while. And the more that I grow and the more that I serve, the more I realize how far I have. The more I realize how how messed up I am and how I've got to have God's help or I can't do it. I can't go on. I can't stand the success. I certainly can't stand the failure. I can't stand the rumors. I can't stand the bickering. I can't stand the negativity. I can't make it. You begin to learn how David felt like the man of God, man after God's own heart. Yet when things got difficult and the world caved in around him, David was in a cave crying out to God, God, everybody's against me. God, help me. The more we get to know, we realize how much we have to have God's help. You see, you'd have thought that David as a boy slayed a giant. He should have just rose up and been a conqueror the rest of his life. But the reality is, the further that he went, the more that he depended upon God. So it should be with us. Verse 20, it says, Because of the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. You see, the more we know about the law, you understand that the word was given and the law was given to reveal our sin, to reveal our inadequacies. Some people say, man, the Ten Commandments, those other commandments, all the stuff that the church says, I can't keep those. You're right. Neither can they. None of us can keep all of the stuff. That's the whole point. When we realize that we can't keep it, then we'll quit trying to do it in my own strength and I'll surrender to God. Because it says no one will be justified by their works. No one will be justified by the law. We can try to keep the law. We can do it as good as we can. We can do it as good as we can. We can do the works. We can try to be as nice. We can try to do all the stuff. But at the end of the day, it's not by the law. It's not by our works. That's why Ephesians 2.8 is in there. It's not by your own works so that no one can boast, but only by, and we're not there yet, but by the grace of God. It's a gift. It's something that he's given us. But until we understand that I can't do this on my own, that I'm not good enough in my own strength, and then I turn to God. See, that's what the Gentiles did. 
the Gentiles because they never had access to God. They weren't invited to church. They weren't invited to an Easter egg hunt. They weren't invited to Easter service. They weren't invited. And so they had a hunger for God. And so when somebody, the apostles and Paul specifically first started preaching Jesus and telling them, hey, he's the way, the truth, and life. He covered your sin. He made it all clear. You're good. He's a good, good father. You're a son of God now. You're no longer a orphan out there or one of those other kind of kids that has no parents but you have a father that loves you and when the gentiles heard that man they were all in we want this they received it fully by grace and you had the jews over here and they were saying we've done it all our lives man we don't need it because we've got the system because my dad did it and my granddad did it and we're just going to do it the way and the point is they could never receive it by grace does that make sense i'm getting way off track and that's what Paul's doing all through these, the last two chapters that we've been going through. He's making the case that it's not because you're a Jew. It's not because of your lineage. That shows you the way you ought to know this stuff ahead of time. But all that stuff that you do, if you really have it in your heart, it ought to be showing you that you do need a Savior. Because you can't make it according to the law. You're never made right with your legalistic attitude or mindset. It's only... Through grace. So I say that and I'll get back to kind of where I was. But the law is sometimes we think the Old Testament's boring. It's too much. I don't make sense. The, the law, let me tell you something. The law is not stupid. The law is not boring. It's not outdating. It's not something we just need to skip. But it gives us knowledge of sin. The sin in the world. That's what it was given to reveal the sin of the world. And it also reveals our sin. And this is a really important reality that the church today does not want to talk about. Revealing and seeing our own sin. We want to see what's right with us. We want to sing the good, good father all day long. And he is. But until we understand that we, how flawed we are and the sin that we have, I don't think we can ever really fully enter into what he has for us, the love that he poured out for us, to understand how much he loves us, until we see the reality of our own sin. And when we see the reality of our own sin, then we can, run, can run, come running to him and fully accept it and be grateful for it. And this is where I got off track, but the, that's why the Jews weren't grateful. And the Jews couldn't receive it because they want to be because we're better. And because we know more and because we've done it longer and because that's who we are. But when we understand that it's not by what we do and it's not even by the law. So now we can move and shift to we're not. Not do I just want to desire to know some stuff to make me feel better or to know a little bit more about God. But this is, this is where I get the whole concept, my thinking for this book of Romans is. I don't want to just have some knowledge, but I want to belong. I want to belong to God. I want to belong to Daddy. I don't want it to feel weird when I cry out like Jesus cried out, Abba, Father. Abba Father, I'm in a bind today. Abba Father, my marriage is really difficult right now. Abba Father, my kids are wearing me out. Abba Father, I, I, we need some help in our finances. Abba Father, because I know that you're a good, good father, and I know now that I belong to you because I've seen my trespass, and I've seen how you sent your son, and now I belong to you and because I belong to you I know that you care about the intricate details of my life about the rumors and the battles that I'm facing because you are a good good father and I cry out to you Abba daddy help me in this thing because I belong to you and uh, it's belonging it's not knowing and sometimes I guess there's a shift I was probably there but there's a there's this line and when we, move, when we move past just knowing about it, when we move past just knowing some of the stuff and we get in and say, you know what, I belong to you. I understand that you've purchased me. I accept it. So we, now we get to the good news. Verse 21, it says, apart from the law <clears throat> or in response to the law, being it shows how messed up we are, in response to the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested. 
It's been witnessed by the law and the prophets. It's been manifested, not just spoke of, which it was by the Old Testament scriptures and the prophets. It was spoke of, but it was manifested. We serve a God who didn't just send us signs and wonders and all that stuff that's really cool and tell us that he loved us, but it was manifested. In other words, it came to existence. It came to where we could see, taste, and touch it, and that was in Jesus. It was brought forth. It brought forth, and it replaced what the law couldn't do. The law revealed that I'm not good enough. The law revealed that I'm messed up. The law revealed that I have a sinful nature, and when we see that, then the Son is sent. The son, the perfect lamb that was slain. Do you understand? I don't, gosh, this is getting long and it wasn't supposed to be. But, I mean, this is old, simple stuff that most of you know. But you know, in the Old Testament, the Jews, they would have over and over, every month, periods of year, when they would have the harvest and the feast and all this stuff, certain times of year, the Passover coming up quickly, which is now at Easter, but so they would have to go and they would, they would make sacrifice and they would shed blood. There was shedding of blood. The blood was spilt on the altars. They, they slaughtered the, the animal. And then they would sprinkle the blood on the altars and on the robes of the priests. And they would do all this stuff. And I'm not prepared to teach about this. But this is what they would do. And this is where I'm going is because that didn't fix everything. That just gave us peace with God so that we could move on until the perfect sacrifice being Jesus. So that's another reason that not only did he take a whipping, did he take my punishment, but that's the reason that he had to bleed. Because there is no sacrifice, there is no peace, there is no good offering without the shedding of blood. But when Jesus' blood was shed and it poured down over the altar, that's what covered us. That is what made us right. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's the blood that makes everything right. The, the, ah, where am I even going? I'm just saying it was manifested to us. It wasn't just told us. It was shown to us. It was given to the world. It was brought forth to do what the law couldn't do. But they work in combination. Because the law reveals we're messed up. Jesus comes and is our Savior. It was manifested. So here's the question. Going back to am I better than they? So who's it for? Who is this gift for? Is it just for the religious folk? Was it just for the Jews? Absolutely not. So in our day and age, to make it relevant to us, who, who is it for? Who's this message for? Is it just for the Baptists? Is it just for the Methodists? Is it just for the Catholics? Is it just for the COCs? Is it just for the Presbyterians, the Pentecostals, the Assembly of God? No. Verse 22. It says, it is for all who place their faith in Jesus. For all who believe in him, there is no distinction. For everyone who believes, really believes, places their faith in Jesus, which we could get into. That's also dealing with repentance and a changed way of living. But all who place their faith in Jesus says there's no distinction. You, you don't be calling yourself better than somebody else, especially another Christian. Because you're all the same in the eyes of the Lord. So here's the, here's the key verse, and we'll be done. And this verse is for humility, and this verse is for motivating us to share the good news. It's verse 23. It says, for all have sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone. In our best day, we fall short of the glory of God. We're not perfect. We have thoughts. We're lazy at times. We don't do things the Lord puts on our hearts. We're not obedient. We're selfish. Whatever. That's just the, the tip of the iceberg. But we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And see, that's what the Lord reminded me. He reminded me when we were down here for two days, and I'm around these people that are really, are for, you know, whatever. But he reminded me again, like he's done many times before. But with this, all this in mind, he reminded me that I'm not better than any of them. I'm not better than anybody else down there. I may be 
saved and some of them not. But that don't make me better than them because he loves them the same way he loves me. And as long as I am aware of that, and as long as we are aware of that, but as long as I was aware of that this weekend, you know what, I was, in, I was able to not focus on that and just focus on what we're doing, and I was able to walk as a representative where I'm at. Because sometimes we're like, well, this ain't church, so I don't have to, you know, I ain't playing Jesus for them. <laughs> Hammerheads. That's wrong thinking. The Lord said, well, that's good. You can be blessed and you can run off down there with your family. But while you're down there, why don't you try being Jesus? While you're at the stock show, why don't you be Jesus? While you're at the workplace, why don't you be Jesus? While you're at the hairdresser, why don't you be Jesus? Lord, they know they need one in there. While you're there. Just kidding. Forgive me. I'll just tell you this. And, and, and I don't know, but it's relevant to this message. But after it. Since I had that, and that was the first night, you know, and I'm stirred up first night, you know. Wanting to, we're like, this is a vacation. Kids are going wild. We're trying to do everything. This ain't no rest. But that evening when I started thinking about this, and I'm thinking about the message tonight, and I don't know if it's a little mini repentance or just changing my focus, but the last two days I probably shared with three or four people while we were there. And two of them was at the bar. And no, I wasn't bellied up drinking. But the bar was right there by the restaurant and right there by the, by the swimming pool. I mean, it's just right there like this little island. And two different people just had a conversation. It, we, one of them had started off talking about golf. The other one had started talking about uh, roping. And both of them, before it was over, turned into about the Lord. And one of them was down there trying to do the same thing we were with his family with his wife, and he was down there, and his wife wasn't there, and when I started asking him why, he said, well, we ain't been getting along real good. And so I'm just saying, with the shift of mindset and understanding, we, anyway, that, does that even make sense? What am I even saying? Not judging everyone we see. We're not better than anyone. We always strive to grow closer to God and we always strive to be better than I was. But that never makes us better than somebody else. As a matter of fact, it puts more burden on us if we begin to see that some people don't. Then we are more uh, inclined or we ought to be more inclined to try to some way share the love of Jesus with them. If we recognize that they're not. So, that's it. Maybe you're here tonight, and we're done. Maybe you're here tonight, and you've been walking. You're saying, man, you're reading my mail. Maybe you're here tonight, and you've been walking in judgment of other people. Just the forefront, every time you go somewhere, you see somebody, they don't respond. The first thing you do is start judging them. Start having negative thoughts. Let me just remind you of Matthew 7, 1, when he says, Don't judge, or you too will be judged. Maybe you're here tonight and you've really, maybe you are in a funk. You really feel like a funk. It's just whatever stuff going on, you feel like you're unworthy. You feel like you've messed up. You just, you just feel like God's far off. Or maybe you're here tonight and you feel like you really got it going on. And you're really doing good. Praise God. But verse 23 is both an encouragement and a humbler to whichever one of those you are. For all have sinned. And falling short of the glory of God. If you're here tonight and you feel like I'm in a funk, I'm not worthy, I'm no good. And the Lord says, all have sinned and fallen short. Nobody's better than you. I love them. I'm for you. I'm not against you. I haven't given up on you. You're blessed and not cursed because you know my name. Or if we're on the other side and we got it going on, the Lord says, all includes you. You fall short. You got to have me. We're no better than anyone. Jesus is the highest level. And think about what he did. He's the highest level. We can't get past his level. And look what he did. The ones that the church judged, he offered them life. They called them drunks. And Jesus said, I'm turning your water into wine. 
They were sick. They were unclean. They were leprous, and Jesus touched them. They said, well, don't even look at them. You can't even look at them when you're unclean, Brett. Touch a dead body. You're out, buddy. Jesus touched them, rubbed them, touched their eyes, healed their sores. The woman who was caught in adultery, a fair, doing all the junk, throwing it around. She was no good. Oh, huzzy. He brought her to Jesus. What are you going to do with her? Surely we're going to stone her. What's the word say? Jesus said, if you ain't got no sins, get after it. He loved her. And ultimately, he gave his life. Even for the ones that rejected him. He said, this is it right here. For the last night when the Lord Jesus was gathered with his disciples, he took the bread and he blessed it. And he broke it. Foreshadowing that his body would be broken by us. And after supper was ended, he took the cup. And again, he gave thanks. And he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. It can do what the old one couldn't do. It was shed for you and for everybody else. For the forgiveness of sin. For the realization that you don't live up to it, but I'm dying for you. So that you can belong to God. Pray with me. Father, I love you. I thank you for this night. I thank you, Lord, just as we're here. We're just... Lord, I just pray for a spirit of humility. Not one of us in this place stands out above anyone else. Not one of us is a lone ranger. That we've all fallen short. But, Lord, in the same pretense, Father, let us understand that you and your infinite grace and your wisdom and your mercy and your love as a good, good father. said, I'm going to help you have a way to be right with me. I'm going to send my son. And so, Father, I just pray that there would be a spirit of encouragement in this place as we humbly bow at your feet like that song we sang earlier. We would be at the foot of the cross. There's no safer place to be because it's there that you cover us. It's there we're cleansed. It's there we become sons and daughters. And so, Father, I just pray that you would bless this tonight as we come and partake, that you would feed us, that you would remind us of whose we are. We belong to you.